Psalm chapter number 19. Begin reading in verse number 9. <clears throat> the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Now, in these verses, we start off, David in verse number one, starts with the glory of God, about how it's proclaimed everywhere that the firmament showeth his handiwork. In other words, everywhere that you can walk, you can see the handiwork of God. Right? And as I read verses like that I think of places like the Grand Canyon where if you go and you look at it it's beautiful but if you study it it gives you a little bit more context Grand Canyon as long as it is and as wide as it is if you go you can see all the different layers of dirt that are stacked up on top of each other and then if you go and you believe the archaeologists they have tested those different kinds of dirt and that dirt comes from all over the world there are places where the only two places you're going to find that dirt are somewhere else in the Grand Canyon. Well, how to get there? God put it there during the Great Flood. Amen. You can literally see the handiwork of God. Right? You can go and you can look at a tree and understand that there isn't anything else walking around on the earth that made that tree. Right? Nothing that we see is capable of making a tree or making a newborn baby or making anything that's been made. I'll remind you that the Bible says that one lily, right, in all its beauty that God arrayed it with was far more beautiful than Solomon in all of his glory. Right? Even one flower outshines all the majesty that man can drum up. Right? Well, by the time we get down into verse number 9, David's talked about how great God is and the handiwork of God and how wonderful God is, how holy God is. But then we get down to verse number 9. And David says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. What's that mean? It means that the fear of the Lord, there's nothing wrong in fearing and honoring and reverencing God. It is a clean thing. But it does say that it enduring forever. Whether you choose to partake in honoring and revering, or reverencing God, doesn't change the fact that for all of eternity past and all of eternity future, Right? Today included. There are angels flying around the throne of God saying, Holy, holy, holy. Right? There are cherubims that are stationed before the throne of God that keep people or to keep other angels from approaching God's presence because not anybody just gets to walk up and speak with God. Right? God is revered and feared every second of every one of our days and has been for all of time because that's who He is. But it's a clean thing. And if you want to, you can get in on it. Part of fearing God is worshiping God. Part of fearing God is offering praise to God. Part of fearing God is submission. Yes, people don't like that part. But there's a whole lot of good that comes from it too. We'll get to that here in a second. But anyway, it says the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. That word altogether means encompassing everything. I mean, everything about every single one of God's judgments is true and is righteous. Can't get away from it. He says, more desired are they than gold, yea, than fine gold. Y'all know that there's two different types of gold? Two different categories of gold, I should say. There's gold, and then there's fine gold. Gold is what they get out of the washing pans when they go down to the river and you know you saw all the old prospectors and the flannels and the big goofy hats right and they're panning for gold in the river that's gold gold is what they if you find it you go and you light up some TNT and you come out with gold that still has hunks of rock attached to it right that's gold 
Gold on its own has impurities. Right? You can't just take gold out of the ground and then take it down to the jeweler okay, and say, hey, I want to sell this and expect to get the going rate for gold or whatever it is per ounce. Because that's the price for pure gold. That's the price for gold without impurities. Okay, Y'all know that most of the gold that goes into jewelry is not fine gold? Fine gold is too soft. Fine gold has to be at least 99.9999% pure gold in order to be categorized as fine gold. That's too soft for you to make a ring out of. That's soft enough that if you, you know, God forbid, shut your finger in a car door, you're going to have a ring that is now shaped to the mashed, you know, image of your finger. Right? That's soft enough that if you scraped it up against something, it's going to take a hunk out of it. Right? You're going to lose value because it's so precious. Right? Most of what we have on jewelry and what people wear, and nowadays, if you can even find gold coins, right? it's just the outer layer that is that fine gold. It's mixed with things right? to get, make it stronger. So the psalmist is not just saying, hey, it's more valuable than gold. Don't get me wrong. You find a hunk of gold in your backyard, you're going to get a lot of money for it. Just don't expect pure gold rates. Right? He's saying it's not just more valuable than gold. It's more valuable than the fine stuff. The stuff that they give top dollar for. The stuff that you can take that and make a whole lot of jewelry out of it because we're going to be mixing other metals with that gold. Right? That's the standard that has to be used in order for international cu currency. Back in the day when you could pay for things with gold doubloons, right? It had to be fine gold or else it didn't meet the cut. That's why in all the old Western movies, if somebody tried to pay with a gold coin, the guy behind the counter would bite it to make sure that it was real gold. Because if it didn't pass the test, it wasn't going to be accepted as payment. Well, the psalmist is saying God's judgments are more valuable than those. More valuable than even fine gold. Why? Because gold is valuable because it is desired. Right? People want it. The truth is, is that the thing that you should want most in this world is God's judgments. By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, we're instructed to live. The very judgments of God are the outline for how you're supposed to live your life. Right? This right here all the recorded judgments of God, you do realize that that is your handbook on not only how to come into a relationship with God, but how God expects you to live after you get saved. This right here is every metric by which you're going to be judged. And yet people will take this, throw it into the car seat and forget about it for a couple of days. Right? There are people that take these things and they lay it up to where moth and mold can corrupt over the centuries this right here is far more valuable than fine gold but then he says sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb he says it's not just valuable it's sweet y'all ever realize you don't have a problem with the judgment as long as you weren't at fault there's no problem with truth as long as you and truth are agreed. Right? You can sentence as many people as you want to for drunk driving. Doesn't bother me. In fact, it's sweet knowing that we're not going to have to deal with them jokers on the road anymore. They're not a danger to other people. Right? Send somebody to jail for not paying their taxes. Doesn't bother me. You can talk about taxes all you want to. I pay them. It doesn't bother me. You can talk about tax all you want to, how we're paying too much or too less. Don't care. That's out of my hands. But you can bring up taxes and the world's still sunshine and roses. Doesn't bother me. Why? Because I'm in agreement with those things. Right now you want to start talking about speed limits. You may not be able to, you know, yeah, I probably drive a little too fast sometimes. Okay? Right, not so sweet there. Not sweet as honey in the honeycomb. Right, Y'all ever notice it's not just your imagination? 
It's real easy to find out when people start, or when the preacher starts hitting where people actually live. You know why? Because usually all the amens stop. That's not sweet as the honeycomb anymore. That's not flowing milk and honey anymore. That's the preacher's hitting a little too close to home. Well, is it not the Word of God? Does not God do all things well? Amen. If heaven's sweet, so are God's judgments. Sweet is the honeycomb, it says. You know what the difference between heaven being sweet and what you've got an issue with being sweet? It's you. It's not the Word of God. It's the same all over. You know what its standard is? Holiness. You know why people like heaven? Because when we get there, we're going to be holy. Right? But if you'll remember when we talked about the book of Revelation, there's a lot of hardship and heartbreak between now and that new body that we get to where we'll be like him. We've got to go through the judgment seat of Christ. That's going to be a day of much tears, much heartbreak to find out how much we didn't meet God's approval after we got saved. But if you're right with God, you confess all them things before you go to meet Him. It can be sweet to think about the judgment seat of Christ. Why? Because you know that there aren't going to be any surprises there. You know that you've laid up your treasure in heavenly places. You didn't invest in wood, hay, and stubble. You've got gold, silver, and precious gems. You're going to be able to lay it down at the feet of Christ and say, Lord, this was all for you. That's a sweet thing. But if all you're focused on is what you haven't been doing, it's not so sweet. But our position doesn't change the fact that honey tastes like honey. God's judgments are as much honey as the fact that for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Right? Be ye separate. Be called out. Right? Have some standards in your life. That's just as sweet. As here in the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because you're one of the shepherd's sheep, he wants you to look like one of his sheep. He doesn't want you out there wandering around on your own. No, he's got standards for you. Those are sweet when you submit to them. But then, verse number 11, Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. We've already talked about that great reward. That's that gold, silver, precious gems. Laid up where flame can't touch it, moth can't touch it, rust can't touch it. Corruption can't touch your treasure if you submit to the judgments of God. But the first part of that verse, it says that by them, the servant is what? Warned. You realize that God didn't give you judgment after you did something. He gave you all the judgment up front. You walked into Christianity knowing what God said about everything or having the capability of finding out what God said about everything. God's got no hidden loopholes or snares or fine print that are out there to trap you. That's the work of the devil. God has always been blatantly honest about what he expects from his children, from his servants, from his followers. He didn't hide it. He didn't say you had to go meditate for 30 years in a cave somewhere without eating food every day in order to obtain understanding of what God expects from you. No, God just told you. The Bible sums it up really clearly. You know what God expects? Christ. But then God went one step further and said, here's all the reasons that you couldn't be your own Christ. Those are his judgments. Right? The law was to show us that we couldn't be Christ. That we would never be able to become Christ. That it took Christ coming to fulfill the law in order to redeem us. So that we could receive what? Grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. The judgments of God, if you take them away, there's no salvation. Because without the judgments of God, there is no distinction between the heathen and the believer. There is no distinction between someone that knows God and doesn't know God. But those judgments are warnings. So much, especially if you were raised in a modern society, so much of modern society, whether they admit it or not, is derived off of 
Judeo-Christian standards that a lot of our laws reflect the laws that are in the Bible. Now, there's a lot of them that they ignored or that they write off. But see, there's not a whole lot that's going to catch people by surprise. If you were raised with the fear and respect of your parents, right, to obey those that have authority, right, there's not a lot in here that's going to buck you when it comes to societal interaction. Right, Jesus bucked a few of them when he said, if a man compel you to go with him a mile, to go with him twain, they didn't like that. Right, that's a judgment, by the way. If somebody compels you, that means you don't have a choice in it. Show them that you're not doing it begrudgingly, but that you do it joyously. That's a judgment. But you're warned with that. Why are we warned with that? Because if the world thinks that you hate something, it's going to keep putting it in front of you over and over and over again. Trying to anger you. How many times have we heard our pastor preach on he who angers you controls you? Amen. You know what the judgment, go with him twain, was to do for us? It was to change our heart to where we don't hate the one that's asked us to do it. Instead, we see it as an opportunity to be a light to him. The devil doesn't like you being a light to other people. But he's saying, Brother Jordan, I'm saying God gave you warnings. So much of this is not correction. Right? Although there are those that get saved that were, you know, murderers, that were capital offenders, that were things that the world would see as worse crimes than other crimes. Right? There's just sin. When you got saved, right? I doubt that there were a whole lot of murderers in this room when they got saved. Right? That wasn't a correction for you, that was a warning. When you get saved, you don't know anything about separation and how there's the fleshly man and there's the spiritual man and how you have to feed the spiritual and you have to nail that fleshly man to the cross every day and take up that cross and follow you. Amen. There are a lot of deeper things in the Word of God. Now you've got to get the foundation laid before you can get there. But you know what the judgments of God are? They're warnings. Doesn't matter where you are in your spiritual walk. It still means the same thing. It still has a red flag or a, a postmark on the road that says, hey, don't go past this point. Past this point, there's danger. Past this point, God judges it as being wrong or being filthy or being unclean, being unrighteous. The judgments of God are the flashing yellow lights on the interstate that say, hey, in about two miles, this lane ends, and if you're still in it, you're going off-road. Right there to get your attention. Therefore, you're good. But then, verse number 12, says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Now, if you're not careful, because this entire psalm has been talking about God, in the verses that we have read, verse number 9 is talking about the fear of the Lord. Right? Reverence of God. Then we get to verse number 10, the judgments of God. Right? Then, verse number 12, it says, who can understand his errors? See, David, he's a pretty, pretty intelligent guy. He may have just been a shepherd, but God gave him a little bit of common sense. Okay? You notice that in all of these verses, when David talks about things pertaining to God, he uses the word Lord with all capital letters, L-O-R-D. When David talks about God, he lets you know that he's talking about God. Amen. What that nomenclature, we see it as just a capital L-O-R-D. What that meant in Hebrew, in their tongue, it was the name Jehovah with all the vowels taken out. Amen. Because they would dare not write the very name of God, so they abbreviated it, to still give him reverence, but not to presume to actually write the name that God said was his name. Amen. Good. So if David's talking about God, he lets you know he's talking about God because he uses his name, the abbreviation for it. Which nowadays, in English, we would call Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. 
Right? That's Jehovah is what that word means. So when we get to verse number 12, he's not saying that his is referring to God. God has no errors. Jehovah is perfect. You don't believe me? Go read this psalm. Start in verse number 1 and tell me if you come to any different conclusion other than the fact that God doesn't have error. So what's verse number 12 talking about? It says, who can understand his errors? It's talking about his own errors. Which one of us in here, if you were wrong, would know you were wrong all on your own? You can't. Right? There's two different things going on in these verses. We just got done talking about the judgments of God. Right? He just said in the verse before this, they're warnings. Right? To tell us ahead of time, this is what's right and this is what's wrong. Then we get to verse number 12, and it says, who can understand his errors? That is a rhetorical question that he's asking between you and the person writing the psalm, David. He says, can you know when you're wrong unless somebody tells you that you're wrong? Well, what is an error? An error is something that is done incorrectly but unknowingly. An error does not have intent behind it. Okay? If you were to take a little child, and I'm talking little, and put them in front of one of them boards that has all the different shapes in it, and then you've got all the blocks that are those shapes. If they go to put one into the wrong spot, they don't know better. They're just clanging wood pieces together. Right? That's an error. But then there's something called a transgression. You know what a transgression is? That's when you know the difference between right and wrong, and you do the wrong thing anyway. A transgression, you have already been taught beforehand what is right and wrong. You have an understanding between what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. But an error is somebody who doesn't know any better. Y'all know that expression, ignorance is bliss? You know why ignorance is bliss? Because before you found out any different, you thought that you had everything figured out. You thought you knew enough to get on by in life. But after somebody comes on and turns that little light bulb on, you figure out how much you don't know. Amen. Now see, I don't seek to presume anything today. But I do know that there's a half of this that hadn't been told. It's waiting on us in heaven. I know that there's nobody this side of heaven don't care how much you study, don't care how much you devote to meditating on the things of God. There's nobody this side of glory that's going to know the Word of God better than God Himself. Amen. Amen. Are we not instructed to be holy as He is holy? Yes. Are, we not, are we not instructed to study to show ourselves approved unto God? You know, that means you've got to know this Bible to where God approves of it. Not man. Not the board that gives you some certification. Right? You've got to pass God's test on the Word of God. Now, am I saying that God expects everybody to know every jot and tittle? No, Christ knew every jot and tittle for us because we were incapable of keeping every jot and tittle. He fulfilled the law and He f became the Word made flesh so that He could redeem us. Right? Because sin has cursed our minds, we're incapable of retaining infinite knowledge like Adam did before he fell to sin. Right? You all realize that before Adam sinned, Adam had a brain like God. He had the very same mind that was in God because he was made in the image of God. We don't have that capability any longer. But you know what I do find? The things that we care about, we remember them. The things that mean the most to us, we don't have a hard time bringing those things back to our memory. Right? I'm not saying that you're ever going to be able to know the Word of God like Christ knows the Word of God. One day you will, when we get to heaven. One day you'll know this half and the other half, just like you wrote it. Because you'll have a body just like the one who did write it. You'll be restored to that pre-sin, edemic nature that Adam had in the garden. And you'll have never-ending fellowship with God. 
But what I'm saying in that is, anybody in here who thinks that they know the Bible well enough today to get by for the rest of their life, they're wrong. There's always something that you don't know that God desires and wants you to understand. Well, until you understand it, you're not going to realize what it is that you're lacking. Let me put it this way. If we were to take the fuel gauge out of your car, you can do all the math you want to and how many how much gas you average per gallon and whether you're driving city or whether you're driving highway the truth is you'll never really know how much gas is in that gas tank until it runs out then you've got none or unless you're all the way topped up because you can't put more in it right you could say well I ran out of gas that used to be true because gas gauges didn't work that great you could think that you had gas and then lo and behold you didn't have gas you ran out of gas anybody that quote unquote runs out of gas nowadays is an idiot okay I don't care unless you had the gas tank fall off of your car while you were driving or you had a hole in a fuel line that you didn't know about okay you cannot run out of gas today right you was dumb and you forgot to put gas in it for too long that's what it is Right? It beeps at you. It flashes lights at you. Every time you start it, it makes annoying sounds. Right? Amen. Everything about modern day cars. I mean, you can go back 20 years in cars. You can't run out of gas on accident. You have to purposely forget to put it in there. Right? Or you just think that you know better than the car system and the little needle that says E and it's already gone past E and it's underneath it but you think, nah, we still got a few more miles left in there. Hey, you passed four gas stations between where you saw that and where you ran out of gas. You wouldn't have had to push the car to the gas station if you stopped at one of the four gas stations. Right? That's just called being ignorant. Being stupid. Why? Because there's no excuse. What are you saying? People know better when it comes to stuff like that. But let's say we took all that away. Right? Give a 16-year-old a car with no gas gauge in it and tell them it's got a full tank and good luck. They're running out of gas. May not be today, may not be tomorrow, but unless they stop every day and they're putting gas in it all the way, someday they're running out of gas. Why? Because they have no understanding of full, empty how much going this far down the road drains from out of the gas tank well until you have that understanding that God gives you from the word of God you may have been doing something in error but you didn't know it why because you had no understanding of it it could be one of those building blocks that until you get down with you know submission God's not going to move on to humility Right? Until you start submitting yourself to prayer and developing a prayer life, God's not going to use you as a prayer warrior for an intercessory prayer to somebody else because you haven't proven yourself to be faithful. Right? Until you commit yourself to what God has already done, God can't add to it. Well, if you're focusing on laying down the foundation for a house, okay? You may have bought all the lumber, but you haven't inspected it yet. Why? Because you've been working on the foundation. But once the foundation's settled, you go looking at some of the some of them boards are bent. Well, how are we going to fix that? Right? You were ignorant of the fact that there needed to be some more carpentry work until what happened? Somebody came along and showed it to you. You know what the psalmist is begging for in verse number 12? Who can understand his errors? He's saying, who's smart enough to figure out what God finds is acceptable and unacceptable unless God tells them? Who here is holy enough on their own that they don't need God to tell them what's right and wrong? He says it's impossible. So then he begs God, cleanse thou me from secret faults. He's not talking about faults that are secret from God. 
God sees and knows all. He knows the very thoughts and intents of your heart. In fact, the Bible says that no man can know his own heart. It's deceitfully wicked. Thankfully, God does understand it. Those secret faults are not things that are hidden from God. They're things that are hidden from you. From yourself. Things that you don't even know. That need to be addressed. Now, am I trying to guilt you into feeling sorry about something you don't know that God wants you to change? No. Because God himself, when he had David pin this down, used the word error. That means you didn't know better. You want to know what an error is? Go read about when Noah got off of the ark. Noah had no idea that if you left grape juice, the pressed fr juice of ripe fruit off of the vine, normally if he'd have drank it, that wouldn't have done anything to him. But see, he wanted to set it aside and save it for the special occasion of when God let him off of the ark. He wanted to take some of the fruit that God had gave him beforehand and then enjoy it later on. Knowing that when the ark came down, the earth would have been destroyed. They wouldn't have had grapes to go out and claim. Why? Because they hadn't grown yet. Noah didn't know that if you cork them suckers up and you leave them on a shelf for months at a time, that there's a process called fermentation. You will never find that God faulted Noah for drinking the fermented wine that came off of the ark because Noah didn't even comprehend that grape juice could be turned into alcohol. He didn't know the process. He didn't know how to make it happen. He had never been drunken with wine before. In fact, for a hundred years, over a hundred years, guess what he was doing? Every day from the time he woke up until he went to bed, he was working on building an ark and preaching while he was doing it to other people that God's judgment was coming. Noah didn't even entertain the idea that something that was pure could be corrupted without anybody doing anything to it. He thought there had to be a process. He thought that something had to be done to it. Right? If they took all of the expiration dates off of milk cartons, some of y'all would find out real quick that things can go from good to bad real quick without anybody touching it. In fact, it can happen really, really quickly. Not to mention, they didn't have refrigerators back then. Nowadays, you can buy grape juice that was squeezed three weeks ago, and because they mix stuff into it, and because you keep it in the fridge, it'll be good for three more months. They didn't have that luxury. It was in a hot, humid ark with a whole bunch of smelly animals. That grape juice had no chance of staying grape juice on its own. God never once laid that sin to Noah's account. Why? Because it was done in error. But yet we get the contrast of his son, Ham, who, knowing that it would have been wrong, chose to look anyway and transgressed. He suffered judgment for that decision. Why? Because he knew better and he did it anyway. There's nothing wrong in making an error as long as you learn how to correct it. That's why God gives us his judgments, illuminates them to us. Why? So that we can correct the error. An error is something that can be fixed. A transgression is something that was done on purpose. You can't just fix that. You can't fix a willful decision of disobedience. That takes work on a spiritual level. An error can be something as small as, well, you zigged instead of zagging. Okay, next time I'll zag instead of zigging and everything will be fine. Right? An error could be you did everything right up until this point and then you did everything right after that but because of this one thing right here the whole thing is an error. It could be very complex it could be very simple but an error once it's been shown to you it's your responsibility to correct it. Why do you think he's begging God to show him secret faults? So that those things that are secret to him he can get them made right. He doesn't want things, whether he knows about them or doesn't know about them, to come between what God wants him to be and where he actually is at. Because that's the love and the desire that David had. 
In fact, how many times does the Bible reference that David was a man after God's own heart? It pained David to even think that there were things he didn't know about that God was unpleased with in his life. He's saying, Lord, let me know about them so that I can get them made right. He's saying, your judgments are sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. He says, I understand that your instructions, right, they're the warning flags of my life and that I should live on this side of the flag instead of that side of the flag. He says that I cherish each and every one of them. But you know what I see in David that I don't see in very many Christians today? The desire to become aware of themselves. David wasn't content in what he knew about himself. David was concerned in what he didn't know about himself. David knew a whole lot about God, but he knew there was a whole lot more that he didn't know. And he knew that in order to know more about God, he had to get more serious about becoming what God wanted him to be. You don't get access to those treasures that he talks about because of the judgments without following the judgments. You want to know more about Jesus, as the psalm writer said, or the songwriter said? It's real simple. Ask God what's keeping you from knowing more about Him. The Bible talks about how God gives wisdom liberally to all those that ask of Him. He's no respecter of persons. The Bible talks about, in the New Testament, about how God doesn't make any distinction between the Jew and the Greek, or between... Uh, uh, disciple of Apollos or a disciple of Paul, right? Or a disciple of Timothy or of Luke or John or Peter. Didn't matter. The same salvation was given to all. Because we all receive the same salvation, we can all receive the same access to God. And you know what God desires you to be? The spitting image of His Son, Jesus Christ. He wants you to receive all that He has for to offer you so why haven't we gotten to that point yet because there are things about ourselves that instead of seeking them out we shy away from them we're happy being in error as long as we don't know about it Lord I've gotten spiritual enough God I've handed out tracts enough Lord I've done what I'm comfortable with doing that's your problem it's uncomfortable finding out things about yourself that you didn't know were there. I've said this before, Brother Randy. Being honest, it's going to sound sarcastic, but it's not sarcastic, okay? I never knew until I met somebody at work that I could l genuinely want to hurt a geriatric lady. I didn't know that that was a part of me, Brother Randy. I never met an old lady that I actually wanted to hurt before until I met somebody at work like that. Did I act on it? No. But I didn't know that that was a part of me, Brother George. I was always taught to respect your elders, right? Something about that lady gets under my skin. I want to kick her. Don't know what it is? I do. That's something I got. didn't know that was a part of me, right? I never thought, like, I'd be one of them guys on the news one day. Like, you see, like, you know, old guy pushes old lady over at store for, you know, a shopping cart. Like, who in the world would do that? Now, I, I, that's a part of me. Not saying it'd be any old lady, but if it was the right one and it would, if all the dots got checked, right, there'd be an old lady in the floor, okay? What am I saying? I'm saying outside the grace of God, there goes I. I didn't know that was a part of me. There are other things that I didn't know were a part of this flesh that after realizing it, you'd think, I never would have thought that's the point. You were doing it in error. You were unaware of it. God knew about it, but God had to reveal it to you. But once it's revealed to you, then you have the decision. That's why people don't go seeking what's missing. Because they know once they find what's missing, they're going to have to ask the Lord to add it to their life. David wasn't afraid of the work that he would have to put in on the altar, or in the temple, or in meditation upon the things of God. He said, Lord, whatever it takes, show me those secret things that are errors, and I'll get them made right publicly with you. 
David sought out things that made him uncomfortable, that pushed him out of his comfort zone. Because he knew if he was comfortable, then he would become complacent. If you don't believe me, go look at when David lusted after Bathsheba. Where was he? He was in a comfortable place instead of a place of conflict down at the battle. When he was comfortable, he had time to wonder. But this David and the, the psalmist, he's saying, Lord, no, show me those secret things. David didn't know before Bathsheba that he had the ability to lust after one of his best friends, one of his most loyal servants, wives. But if he would have sought it out beforehand, God would have showed it to him, and he could have made the error right before anything happened. But what did he do? He willfully made a decision, then willfully tried to cover it up, and willfully slew one of his mighty men of valor. You know what those were? They were transgressions. And as a result, the sword did not leave the lineage of David. His descendants paid the price, just like he did. God honored him with a time of peace. But after Solomon, things started going downhill really quickly. You say, that's a lot of impact for one decision. Yeah. You don't know what your actions today, how big of an impact they're going to make in eternity. God's serious about those hidden things, those secret things that you haven't discovered about yourself yet. How concerned is God with them? So much so that he gave us an example through David in this psalm of begging God to reveal those things to us. But I don't know where the idea crept into modern day Christianity that everything about being a Christian is doing for other people. No. No. A whole lot of Christianity is making sure you get yourself out of the way so God can do things for other people. Right. So much of Christianity is dealing with yourself so that God can use you to reach other people. Yeah. You know what part of that is? Finding out those secret things about yourself that you don't necessarily want to learn. Finding out those secret things that in the back of your mind you've had a sneaking suspicion that God's wanted to deal with you about it but you've been shying away from it, hoping that you could just ignore it long enough that God would change his mind. Yeah, study the Bible. Let me know how well that's going to go for you. <laughs> Not going to. We started off in verse number nine. The fear of the Lord is a clean thing. You know why David sought out finding those secret things about himself? Because he feared God so much that even the thought of being cross with God put enough fear of God into him that he didn't want to meet God knowing that there might be something that wasn't right in his life David wanted to know for sure that he had done everything that God had instructed him to do and that he'd be able to stand before God and say I was your faithful servant not I was a sometimes faithful servant no I was a faithful servant where does that desire come from? A fear, reverence, and love of God. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.